Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to today's event with Andil Gosain, discussing his latest book, Nature's Wild, Love, Sex, and Law in the Caribbean in conversation with Faith Smith. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon series and others. On Friday, October 15th, David Hadu and John Carey join us for a discussion of their book, A Revolution in Three Acts, <clears throat> The Radical Vaudeville of Burt Williams, Eva Tongay, and Julia L. Ting, in conversation with Eric K. Washington. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat function of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of Nature's Wild. <clears throat> if you already have a copy or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I'll also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you are able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable it yourself. Simply locate the button marked CC Live Transcript on your display and click through the options. <clears throat> and one final note, as you may know from the large virtual gatherings we've all been attending this past year, technical issues might come up. We do apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Endil Gosain is an artist, curator, and a professor of environmental arts and justice at York University. As a companion project to today's featured book, a collection of his artwork, collaborations, and interventions, a bevy of work that explores the imbrication of ecology, desire, and power, will be featured in a traveling exhibition launching in January 2022. He is also the curator of previous and forthcoming exhibitions at the Art Museum of the Americas, the Ford Foundation Gallery, and the Leslie Lohman Museum. Today, he is joining conversation by Faith Smith, Associate Professor of African and African American Studies, English and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Brandeis University. She's the editor of the 2011 collection of essays, Sex and the Citizen, Interrogating the Caribbean, and is currently at work on a forthcoming study of legacies of intimacy and sovereignty in the work of 21st century Caribbean writers and artists. This afternoon, they will be discussing Professor Gosain's book, Nature's Wild, Love, Sex, and Law in the Caribbean, an interdisciplinary examination of questions of humanism, queer theory, and animality, which Jafari S. Allen calls a compelling new form of scholarship. Gosain's convincing authorial voice and unique point of view nimbly narrate an interrogation of the relationships between neocolonialism and the lack of recognition of the humanity and complexities of Caribbean subjects. Surveying colonial law, visual art practices, and contemporary activism, Gosain thoughtfully troubles the ways in which individual and collective anxieties about wild natures have shaped the existence of people across the Caribbean. We're so excited to be hosting this event this afternoon. Without further ado, I'm now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Professor Gosain and Professor Smith. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Can you hear me? Hello? Hi, thanks. Hi. It's so great to see you, Faye. Okay. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much. And, and thanks to Benjamin for that introduction. Um, I, don't, I guess I should just start by saying how proud I am to be in this conversation with you. I don't have the physical book yet, which is just gorgeous to look at, but um, I have read through it and it's so I, 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 would, I just wanted to begin by saying that it reminded me of um, people who are similarly thinking about what it means to um, think about queer identities, what it means to, um, to, to think about queer identities in quotidian life in the Caribbean, in the region, right? As well as, of course, in relation to diasporic movement, but what it means to be situated in the region. 
And so I'm thinking of your work alongside, I just jotted down Rosamond King. Um, I'm thinking about Lyndon Gill's Erotic Islands, Vanessa Agard's work on sand. Um, I'm thinking about Michelle Rowley and Tracy Robinson who like you combine you know, scholarship and activism and so on. I'm thinking about Matthew Chin's work in the Jamaican context. And so, so that's the first thing I want to say, how proud I am to be in this conversation with you and to, and to have this book now as part of the way that I'm trying to think about the region. But it's also, I want to just say quickly, deeply unsettling for me in that um, it's right up there with, with um, Jennifer Nash's Black, book in, uh, Black um, Bodies in Ecstasy, or even Kayama Glover's A Regarded Self, which I'm just um, um, thinking through, There's, you're asking us to think about what it means to be free and what it means to um, claim and assume our freedom in different terms, because you're refusing the terms that, that frankly I'm still tethered to in the, in the way that we kind of think about um, how to, how to um, how to claim the right to, to be ourselves and to govern ourselves, right? And so maybe you could start by talking about what that means for you and how you've chosen to work through that in this project. Thank you so much, Faith. Let me say how deeply grateful and, and just thrilled I am to be in this conversation with you. You know, your work, who you are, is so important to so many of us. Um, and, I, you know, I feel very much that I'm just sort of like walking down a path that you have carved. So thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be joining you. And thank you to the Harvard Bookstore for making this, um, for, for this invitation. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, that, I think the, one of the things that I start off thinking about in the book is this question of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Because I think for some time, a lot of our conversations about sexuality rights, erotic autonomy have been tied to citizenship. You know, work that I'm, work that has helped me, work that I, I feel very close to, your work, uh, Trace Robinson's work. Um, but there was something about that, that framing that I have to say for me always felt a little bit uncomfortable because you know there's an impetus there's always a you know similar to the way there was something echoing about European man in the way that Sylvia Winter there was something that we were sort of always having to aspire to as no matter how we defined citizenship this thing called a citizen mm -hmm. was seemed a little bit too much uh too much of a yardstick to find even if we were sort of making the making the citizen ourselves so i think that was part of the backdrop for me in in now reaching toward thinking of it slightly differently and lorraine o'grady's work as an artist and as a thinker has been really you know impactful for me in thinking about this because i it's a 10 years ago this year that we had a conversation, Lorraine and I, in which she talked about all of the work that we do to make ourselves civil, to, to be, a, you know, to appear as human, not animal. Right. And, you know, and for her, the, the, the thing that undid, it, un, undid that civility was the place of sex. You know, sex revealed us to be, you know, the animals that we are that right. desire and you know by that she means you know the place of desire mm -hmm. so i think that for me that gave me a kind of lift in which to move away from the citizen the citizenship framing of sexuality mm -hmm. and to really pursue this kind of analysis that was unpacking the social historical and my own personal experience at the same time so there is a way in which you know, I begin the book with being 13 years old at a Catholic boys' school in Trinidad. And there's another moment in which I talk about going, being an undergraduate student and feeling really uncomfortable with the way sexuality, and this is heterosexuality in that case, is being talked about. Because in a lot of the social sciences, particularly in international development, 
you know, which has an enormous influence that I think, particularly in a place like the Caribbean, because so much of the industry of development work impacts how the social sciences right. unfold. Right. I, yeah, so I, so, you know, I'm sitting in that class and thinking like, my parents are, you know, and I use the example of my parents who, you know, are, were not these sort of, uh, faceless, uh, personality-less, you know, the poor that are imagined. So I think at the same time that this is was a new way to move away from the citizenship framework, I think it was also kind of a freedom from something that always felt a bit uncomfortable. It's a really important thing to talk about citizenship rights because we're talking about a relationship to the state, we're talking about legislate, we're talking about real and material things, but I think we also have to recognize the limits and to also take on some of the complexities of various moments. So, you know, I'm, I mean, maybe we don't have to talk about it right now, but I do, I am curious to know how your own, if your, if your own feelings about it have evolved too, you know, have there been things as you have been, you know, since sex and the citizen, have there things for you that have changed in how you think about your approach? Um, particularly in relationship to thinking about sexuality as sexuality rights as a component of citizenship rights. Right. Or citizenship. So, so I guess one way to answer that would be to say that, again, even as I'm unsettled by them, I am drawn to characters who, um, for example, fictional characters who are... Um, who, who don't who don't go through the rights narrative to to kind of think about what and and that's partly because they fall under the radar of that narrative as the work of somebody like Donnett Francis points out there are all these people who were never envisioned as part of the promise of the you know anti-colonial struggles and and um, the post-colonial state they, they don't even come under that radar they're so marginalized and so I'm thinking about a character like, Bolo in um, Brand's <sighs> The Blue Book. <laughs> oh my God. Um, the Moon. Um, it's there. Uh, Come back. The, the my, something of the moon. Oh my God. I knew this uh, would happen. <laughs> so anyway, Blue Book, Moon, Dion Brand. And so there's a moment where Bola's children are strung out on the beach. I mean, it's a classic Moynihan moment. That is to say, this is the, this is the black family that we're trying to retrieve from you know, degradation. So all our um, anti-colonial and feminist struggles are about, you know, look at how they see us. They see us as pathological and her, she completely refutes. She, she doesn't gesture to that at all. Um, and it, 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 whether or not she knows about it or not, we, we get the sense that she, she's not invested in, in what today we would kind of blithely call respectability politics. And then at a certain point, the, the narration tells us, because she's, she's a quintessential bad mother. She has a lot of children and she's not interested in mothering. And she's not ashamed of the fact that she's not interested in mothering. And then there's a moment when it says she, she understood that if, if her children were too close to her, um, they, they, she would, she would um, bequeath them harm. In, in other words, it's a classic sense of um, the, the passing down of unfreedom of the, of the, 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 the um, the, the the mother in the in the wake of, of slavery and indentureship and so on. So she's understood that if her children come too close to her, there's a peril that will attach to them. That doesn't change. I think the, the thing about brand is that that doesn't change a fact that for, for your children, um, the fact of your mother knowing that it's precarious to pass her stuff down, that for your children, that's not very helpful. In other words, it, it's still going to mean, so, so Brand never celebrates that. But at the same, in the full and something of the moon, it's there, one word yeah, more and I'll get it. Light. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, I think that that's really, um, 
So I'm telling you this story, but I'm telling you as someone who I think is still anchored in that sense that um, now, I, now I have to divide it because, because you're not erasing the fact that we have to be invested in rights, but you're also asking why do our desires have to be tethered to that project as well? We don't have to give over everything to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's really important. I want to stick with the development thing because I think it's so weird that you are that that's part of your trajectory like development um i don't know what you call that field um development yeah. studies and and you're sure. also a yeah. practicing artist and so it, and so there's something about the ways that those two paths help inform where what you have to tell us in in this book and i want if you could say something about that yeah yeah, I know those two fields seem like, you know, not very close. You know, I worked for the World Bank at one point so that's um, and I did a master's degree in international development um, and then to take somewhat of a left turn into artistic practice. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it had to do with in development work. You know, we are trained as in much of the social sciences, we heavily focus on conscious knowledge and don't really think about you know, it's one thing to talk about desire in a conscious way. Yeah. It's another thing to grapple with the, you know, the reality of how something like desire works, like at the subconscious and unconscious level. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the drive toward art was also this kind of uh, frustration with the limitations of sort of conscious knowledge. You know, there was a way in which it was failing to capture the complexity of what was going on. Um, and in a way, it links back to this conversation we're having about citizenship. Mm -hmm. Because for me, you know, we, we cannot, you know, this is a very powerful framing going right back to Jackie Alexander is not everybody can be a citizen. You know, that is such an, a critical foundational piece for everyone who works in Caribbean sexualities. It is probably the most significant piece of you know writing on this work um and at the same time i always felt a little bit like but it's always going to be what lorraine calls a both and situation that even if we achieve these sort of goals of re reproducing a different kind of citizen aspiring for a different kind of citizenship mm -hmm. the reality of living in the americas a place that has been colonized, that is built on the, it has a foundation of violence. Mm -hmm. It is really, I think, a bit naive to think we can produce something in which we can escape right. that. Yeah. So when Lorraine uses both and, and she talks about desire always being the place where violence and pleasure are always entwined, you know, for her, she begins thinking about the plantation and you know the violence is there but in the both and framing it you know it forces us to 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 grapple with that history and complexity in a different way to 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 sort of be um to take a different approach than i think it's this sort of i mean mirage is maybe too strong a word to use but there is I, it's the word I'm thinking of now, like something that something that somehow es lets us escape this history and produce something else, because we carry it. We carry it for generations. It's a long time. It's so, it's you know, it's particularly in the Americas. You know, we have nothing. At, that is the foundation of our right. society. Yeah. So I think that that formulation um, was available in artistic practice. You know, Lorraine, you know, a lot of artists are seeking to grapple with truths without necessarily finding a solution. International development is all about solutions. Right. You know, many times, it, many, many times it's solutions that don't work. I mean, I've never seen so much money spent on solving poverty. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of money to be made in solving poverty, except for the poor. So, you know, that is a very what's the solution let's find the goals let's get this the thing out of this what will cure this right. which is a very different approach in artistic practice which is all about uh interrogating and finding and grappling the truth no matter what you find so i think right. the, there was a there was a kind of if a younger me was looking for a way out you know i wanted to 
you know, I have every intention after my master's degree to go back to Trinidad and work on environmental issues. And, um, you know, as I, might, as I matured, I think part of it was just sort of grappling with the both end of our social reality in the Caribbean and more generally the Americas. Yeah. So two things. One is that um, you, in, the, in the track you take here through Sylvia Winter, for example, in questioning, you know, um, the order of man and so on. And through, I'm thinking of somebody like Zakia Iman Jackson. You go to you go to the that kind of human animal, um, you know, as as you began by saying, um, how how does what does it mean to think through the history and of our violation or sexual identity and so on as Caribbean people by by plumbing that line, the human animal line. And of course, the track you take is to say, um, cl claim animality. It's like, ah! <laughs> you know, it's just like, yes. <laughs> yikes. <laughs> Claim animality, which is which is what you're insisting on it. So in, in a in a way, it's a guidebook to claiming yeah. the yeah. animal within. And then secondly, of course, um, and I, and I first came to this essay through Gabby Hossein's and um, gosh, my Lisa name, Uttar. Lisa Lisa, Lisa Uttar. Uttar, um, another blue book. Um, <laughs> the, the, your your beautiful essay in that um, anthology, Wrecking Work, in which you're, it, it, I mean. I use that essay because, again, I guess because I'm unsettled by this idea because you're acknowledging what has been wrecked, but you're also saying that there's a way in which what's, there's a, there's a way in, without justifying, you are saying that what has been wrecked is also um, the, 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 the kind of, you know, the, the things that have been wrecked include class, and mm -hmm. cast yeah. exactly yeah. and so what does it mean that wrecking work might actually be it, it might actually be possible to navigate ourselves somewhere else through through thinking in terms of wreckage what what might it mean to think that way so i don't know if you want to take either of those the the, the wrecking or the claiming animality to kind of uh, talk a little bit about that well, I, I, those are probably the two kind of core ideas that I'm grappling with in the book. So thank you so much for zooming in on them. Um, and also for, you know, for engaging with wrecking work, that essay in particular, because it was, you know, that essay was, um, was, was taking a very observant eye to my mother as some, you know, someone who doesn't write, someone who didn't finish high school, someone who does, but, she, you know, this is one of the, and I looked at my baby album as a kind of, like and a document she made and how did she think through this and what it what that process helped me do is a very kind of you know Foucauldian observation you know when there's where there's power there is resistance and so I think working with that the the wrecking work idea is just recognizing that human spirit that always is pushing against you know no one <laughs> when forces of oppression are uh are executed, there's always resistance, you know, that very basic idea. And I think with wrecking work, what it was trying to do is actually name some of those specific ways in which we recognize that people have always engaged in this process. Like I, you know, it's 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 sort of a ongoing continuous process. So I'm not a fan of thinking about, and this also I am indebted to Jackie Alexander for this, for thinking of time as this linear process of progress. And this, you know, very again, going back to development, you know, very, a very kind of linear notion of time and progress. And Jackie opens up for us palimpsestic time. And I think what that for me is recognized, you know, whether it was 1845 or 2021 people in those situations are always aspiring to find their autonomy. They're doing it in different ways. And at the same time that things are falling apart, and I, in the book, I give the example of what happens during the indentureship period, where you know, this is a period in which there is violence, in which much is lost, you know, cult language is lost, families are ripped apart, cultures gone, you know, all of these things. 
But at the same time, the human spirit is such that it's such a creative uh, uh, afterlife anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that there is justification for the violence. Right. It is certainly not saying like, well, isn't this a silver lining? But it is speaking the truth of the spirit of the human condition, which is the Caribbean epitomizes so well, mm -hmm. you know, from the kinds of things that have been created in that space in the like the aftermath of slavery and the aftermath of indentorship, you know, so in wrecking, and of course I use wrecking because it, uh, can, um, you know, makes us think of boating, the boat and travel and shipwreck. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I, I also, there's a beautiful line in a Cal Torabulli poem, Everything Slackens in a Wreck, which I'm using as a title for an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was just so evocative for me. Everything does slacken, the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it, it takes us away from that linear notion of time and progress, mm -hmm. gives us, give us a different kind of way in which to think about the past, of, you know, of, of, to sort of recognize the, the abilities and strengths and what people have to show us. Yes. Um, and then to go back to the first question, the big one, which is the animal question, was the contentious one. You know, I teach a course, a uh, 30 year course in which just I've, I revisit this theme. And it is a very contentious question at the beginning because of the very long and violent history of animalization being used to justify racialization, racial violence. Right. It is so foundational, but that's the thing, it is. You know, no matter where I was circling around, you know, all of these different contexts, yeah. it kept haunting me, yeah. you know, whether I was thinking of the personal or the social, it, I kept seeing uh, that onus that's been placed from the very beginning of the colonial encounter. Not just that we have placed some humans as more human and others as less human mm -hmm. and therefore justify genocide and slavery and so on mm -hmm. but what in this moment becomes difficult to difficult to contend with is how much we have taken up that onus and so i use something like eric williams's speech youth of the nation mm -hmm. to think about you know where he gives this call to being a certain kind of exceptional human. It is a very uh, common trope, particularly in sort of our imaginations of like middle-class aspirational Caribbean communities. Right, you know? Right. You know, I was sort of some, you know, a very good boy at school, someone who accomplished things, this certain kind of human to live up to. Right. Um, but it is so based on the continuous sort of uh, not just in me being more human, someone else is less so. That's right. But also in this moment of global ecological crisis, and this is where my own kind of, you know, environmental ethics comes in. The poor animal hasn't done it. <laughs> the, the animal is the innocent subject in the sort of what in, industrialization has wrought. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we saw it most recently in these horrifying images of the at the border of. Mm -hmm the, you know, the Haitian immigrants who are being chased down by horrible images, yes. you know, and you heard often it being said, these are not animals, these are humans. Right. So it is also like something that we use to say, treat people like humans. Well, we don't want to treat animals like this either. Right. But I feel like that has been the, the go-to yes. uh, political strategy is that Oh, no, 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 don't, don't animalize us. Look how right. human we are. Right. So I'm offering something else, which is to, to refuse the yardstick, to refuse European man to say, mm -hmm. oh, I am animal because I saw so much freedom. You know, I am someone who in the book, I, you know, quite, quite uh, vanilla, quite, you know, just a, a boy who studied <laughs> not a lot of, um, lot, not a lot of, uh, stories of deviance and so on you know um and i th and i really feel so in awe of people who embrace what embrace their desires and intuitions and instincts in a way in which they do not feel compelled right. to discipline themselves um 
in the way that this onus placed, particularly on the post-colonial subject, particularly that independence moment. You know, it's like at that moment, especially, you see it in Christopher Cozier's work. Yeah, exactly. You know, when he talks about his pieces, it's such, and the other thing for me, when I, when I look at it, it's such a different experience for people who are closer to power and people who are further away because the kind of world in which Christopher Cozier's art emerges is one in which these impulsions to be a certain kind of human, a good citizen are very strong. But in the countryside, away from, you know, further away from power, from institutions, there's not this, you know, I didn't grow up with this kind of sense of like, I have to I have to behave in a certain way, mm -hmm. not to the degree that they, you know, I see happening for people who grew up in a kind of middle class, urban, post-colonial setting, right. because the, the, the onus placed on them is very high. Right. You know? So that's interesting because then you're asking us to be specific about how we, about geography and, and about um, how we map the just internally the, the particular territory that we're talking about. But when you mentioned Williams in the book, um, the, 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 the chapter, William shares a chapter with Colin Robinson. As well they <laughs> the should. God, the Godfather. <laughs> oh my gosh. So just to, I just like to, to um, for us to kind of mark the fact that we've just lost um, Colin Robinson and um, how lovely it is to come to this work and to kind of see you working through um, and kind of theorizing what it means to think about Colin's relationship to this question of um, this the stigma of the 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 um, the, sh the shift from the the colonial subject as um, as um, improperly sexed to the post-colonial subject as improperly sexed, right? So because what, what changes, of course, is that now we're the most homophobic. And so you use Colin's life and work and, and activism to kind of think through that. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Thank you for uh, paying tribute to Colin because, you know, his, my relationship with him goes back to 2007, around the time that Tracy Robinson with Michelle Rowley organized that important conference in Barbados, Sexualities and Conversation. Mm -hmm. And that was my first, that was in 2007, and it was the first time meeting Colin and, mm -hmm. you know, dialogues with him and conversations with him have been such a critical part of my own thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm so grateful to have and feel fortunate to have had that with him. And it is such a tremendous loss and you know so unfair to have happened at a, such a young age yeah. um you know colin colin's politics so radically challenged dominant tropes in gay international organizing you know notions of the caribbean as plainly homophobic without you know contradictions or without complexities mm -hmm. i was especially drawn to you know how aware Colin was about class one of the, my favorite things is such a small gesture which is the Kaiso the organization he ran had a t-shirt that had listed the homosexual agenda and one of the items was buy cricks and cricks is that kind of essential cracker that you know every home probably has from the poorest to the wealthiest and it was such a powerful statement not only about you know the, the humanity of the queer subject but all, you know but also saying so many things like economic well-being was so critical and it was also saying the imagination that we want to have of our erotic autonomy does not have to match the sort of the dominant white male centered like gay movement representation you know of sort of these saviors coming in and the irony too of course like in that chapter as in much of the book it's about the circle of you know the <laughs> the gay like the the, the 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 colonized people the people of the south are beasts because they're gay right. and now they're beasts because they're homophobic that's right 
That's you know? <laughs> so it's very interesting because I, you know, it, it feels like I'm an, you know, to now it, the queer studies in particular has had to go full circle too, has had to come back to this moment and say, oh, actually, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, Colin's, um, Colin's work is so, Colin has so much to teach us still, I think. And I, 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 I've so, I so love being able to put him and Eric Williams in conversation in this chapter because they feel, they take very different approaches to nationalism, I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, and they're, they're negotiating at different times with different forces. So it's, you know, of course that's true, but it is, it, you know, there's no shaming of the, <laughs> There's not a there's not this kind of shaming in Collins' work around sexuality. There's no need that respectability politics goes outside outside the window, and of course that as you know as we, you know as you have said, so much about that emphasis on respectability is about class is about race, mm -hmm. and it really opens up for us. Colin, you know, Colin was such a trini, such a patriotic, you know, he was. Uh, he was a nationalist in his own way. He would right. describe himself as such. Right. But it was a, it had echoes of a different kind of nationalism, which was not narrowing, but broadening. And, yeah. you know, more about the possibilities of freedom right. than in confining ourselves as a, as a ruse through which to access freedom. Which tells us that it's there, which, which is this yeah. thing that, that was so powerful about reading Wrecking Work, where you use your family to say, here are the theorists, here are the persons who um, oversaw and nurtured this, this queer boy before he knew he was a queer boy. It's so powerful because what you're saying is that it's, a, it's already there. That wh mm -hmm. Whatever we're trying to be um, in all these best senses and, and different senses, it's already there. We already have a genealogy for that. If we if we only knew how to kind of look and and look again. Yeah, and to remind ourselves, we are not. You know, I think often we feel, especially in this moment between the pandemic, climate change. It's so you feel defeated. Yeah. You feel you know these years of neoliberal governments and economic agendas. Right. If you like, where can we go from here? How, how, how we have, how these projects of the 50s and 60s and 70s might have failed. Right. But I think when we look closely, I think when we look very closely, we see that in fact, a, this, this rich genealogy of resistance of people asserting freedom in different ways of, you know, things always being fluid and in shift and they're always being these uh, forces in tension. So I think, I think what Collins work does is also sort of stretch our imagination to think about more text, more scenarios. You know, that's why I also pull in these situations that um, we don't necessarily off see an academic study. You know, it's why I talk so much, why I went to my mother's photo album. That's right. why it was important for me to talk about my aunts because okay. it is true. I really did, I cannot think of a single time in which any of these, um, any of these things that I did would seem like deviances from masculinity were disciplined or right. punished. You know, I felt, very supported and loved in that way. Right. So we know it's possible. You right. know, you, you, it, and it is not, and it is not necessary to have accessed a particular kind of education. Okay. It is not the kind of Freudian kind of call to action. It is acknowledging the, I think the spirit, the human spirit in yeah. all, you know, in, or I guess I would have to call it the animal spirit now. Right. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Um, it sounds like I don't know if we have we were we were told that at twelve forty we should wait to yeah. see if we have questions. I, um, I'm not sure if we do. I don't know if Benjamin's gonna come oh, back okay. on. Hi. Yeah. So we do have a couple of questions so far. 
Um, everyone in the audience, feel free to write in. Also, thank you to everyone who wrote in about Dion Brands at the full and change of the moon. That was such a wonderful, no, it was great. It was lovely to see that there were people in the audience who could, who could contribute. And also thank you to <laughs> Professor Rachel Mordecai at UMass Amherst for oh, introducing Rachel, me to her. Yeah, for introducing me personally to the work of Dion Brands. She's a oh, genius. I see. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I love her. So let's jump into questions. Um, everyone, feel free to submit more, but we'll start with this one. An anonymous attendee asks, um, the brilliant writer Mia McKenzie writes on the founding of her project Black Girl Dangerous that claiming her racialized danger was a powerful tool of her survival. Is there a facet of claiming animalness that is about acknowledging, embracing, and retooling some of the language leveled against us? Absolutely. That is exactly the project. I mean, there are two, there are various aspects of the project, and this is one of them. One is certainly displacing the European man, you know, that Sylvia Winter has, uh, you know, exposes us to as being so fundamentally flawed, but, you know, so, so, so remains so powerful. So one is, but another is certainly embracing those aspects that we're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to deny or to run away from. And um, I guess in the question, you know, it, it might be, it might be framed as danger. In, in the book, I think of it particularly in terms of desire of like, you know, uh, embracing one's sexual desires, embracing one's freedoms, embracing, you know, and that, and that has so much, um, my God, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, but you know, whether we're talking about so many consequences, I guess, you know, we're thinking about sex work, or whether we're think, thinking about uh, sex education in the classroom, like it opens up a lot more space for us to think about how we view illicit behavior, you know, what was called illicit behavior and how we view that as a kind of fundamental uh, kind of power of people seizing their desires. Now, this is also not to say that all desires are great. You know, if I, if I left, my dog to her own devices, she would eat herself to death, you know? Like it's not all of, you know, all, but that is it. All of, so it's not simply to glorify animality, but to recognize it. So in the question, I guess I would, I would think of it as less about um, uh, necessarily simply switching it from, you know, a bad quality to a good quality, but seeing the ambivalence of it that it is not simply something to be denigrated, but something that has ambivalence to it. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so another attendee asks, uh, your work mm -hmm. unites a number of different forms of analysis, legal, social, the close reading of art, as well as a bit of memoir. Could you talk about the development of a singular project that brought together all these different threads? Was it challenging to envision bringing them all together? Yeah, that's a question for my whole academic trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I've always, I have to say, you know, I've mentioned Lorraine twice already, but there is a certain personal freedom in country who worked with the State Department, then becomes a rock and roll writer for Rolling Stone, then becomes, you know, an art teacher, then becomes an artist. And, you know, she's able to embrace all of, she gets curious about so many things. Um, and then she finds a way to draw continuity, to have the confidence to base that continuity, continuity through her own experience. And I think watching and learning her experience was fundamental in training me on how to approach and resolve these. Because of course, you know, our disciplinary system is not set up for this kind of approach. Even what we call inter or multidisciplinary is often about adding A and B right. rather than, you know, grappling with something that's a that kind of hybrid. And I think in the project, there was a certain kind of lift in confidence that working with Lorraine and feeling confident about my 
exploration examinations of these issues that allowed me to find that line and i don't think i and i i don't think i found it in academia like i don't know if there's a methodological practice for instance that served me in the way that witnessing lorraine approach her work served me um but yeah I hope that helps answer the question. I mean, you know, Faith, I know you're in the English department and you, you know, are a literary scholar, but how, but you're also someone who, you know, engages policy work, engages other disciplines. How have you dealt with this? I guess I'd just quickly say that um, I think for me, a big thing about that would be, would be one CSA, the Caribbean Studies Association, where really Caribbean is of all stripes. We, co we come every year and kind of think through things. And then I think it's also, I mean, in my own home, I mean, that whatever my parents, whoever my parents were in terms of a specific, um, the specific training that we were engaged, whether it was watching the nightly news or whatever it is together, we're interested in many things at the same time. And so that there's a sense, and I think that that's, a kind of societal thing as well that that every 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 street corner has someone who will tell you how to think about Afghanistan right now like across the, the Caribbean right everybody has a theory about how to explain the Middle East and I so I think that I think that there is a, a sense that we're entitled to kind of take on and think about things um, in different ways. So I'm, I'm, I'm not diminishing the fact that I um, have had to train myself and align myself with different kinds of formal ways of knowing. But I think it, I think we also have to mark the fact that we come from a society, we come from societies in which people claim to, to know things and to have an explanatory power about that and to and to make you sit through that ex, that that explanation um, um, multiple times I, I think that there's a kind of curiosity about the world yeah I agree <laughs> so we have a couple uh, other questions about your uh research and method in developing this project. Um, so I'll just start with this one. What was the most surprising thing you learned in the course of your research for this book? Oh, the most surprising thing. <laughs> um, wow, that's actually a very challenging question to <laughs> answer because you know, it really felt like a, a quite an organic process. Like it felt like the culmination of the past 15 years of thinking about these things and maybe not so continually working with them. Um, I don't know if I had one in particular like surprising moment of research. Faith, I'm curious to know, were you surprised by the turn to animal? Because I think for, I'm curious to know if, you know, that, you know, I have that little art piece where I end with that I am animal. And it's something that, and I, you know, I, I know don't with remember my students. That. I don't remember that art piece. So yes, I was surprised. I didn't, I didn't know that. No, no, I mean, it's in the book. It's in the book. Yes. Yeah. No, what I'm yeah. saying is reading the book, right. Reading the book, yeah. I did not expect that. No. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and again, it's so, it's, it, that presses buttons, as you say, you know, yeah. um, because it, I think we're good about talking about the charge of animality from, you know, from Columbus, as you show so beautifully, but to, but to then root your thing in the very thing that you're charged with, that, that one is, it's like, ah, yeah. so no, I didn't expect that. I didn't yeah. expect that. And I know it's contentious just, you know, like at particularly at the, you know, the way the course usually runs in fall and I have quite a few people, I, you know, quite a lot of black and brown students uh, who almost universally say at the beginning, what are you talking about? You know, I, I use the example in the book of a friend being outraged when he find, he hears this woman call the dog by the name of his mother. Right. You know, because right. it's, but that's exactly it, I think. You know, it carries so much power, like this history of animalizing. I mean, even in that that 
that comment, don't treat us like we are humans, yeah. don't treat us like animal. Like I end the last chapter um, with bringing us back to Isabel, one of the litigants in the case mm -hmm. that uh, Tracy yeah. Robinson, Arif Balkan took to through the Guyanese and Caribbean Court of Justice in which, you know, it's so powerful. Like the, the what's interesting for me is that um, Isabel means to say we are not animals, right. but she says yeah. we are animals. And for me, it's it's not simply this little slip. slip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it's it, it 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 carries so much possibility in it. I think that might have going back to the last question. That was perhaps a bit of a surprise. I didn't have, of course expect to find that piece, right. but in in and so just for people uh, watching who may not know what I'm talking about, uh, there were a number of Guyanese trans people who were arrested for quote being men in women's clothes, um, and after many years through the courts. Uh, and this was all based on an old colonial law, they were arrested. Um, and after many uh, court proceedings over many years, uh, they were victorious at the end and uh, uh, they won their challenge. And one of the litigants was talking about their experiences of harassment um, for being trans. And they mean to say, you know, we're not animals, treat us like humans. And instead they say we are animals. But I think what that slip reveals is also the power within ourselves to claim ourselves as human enough, you know, to claim our subconscious desires are as part of ourselves without, um, without sort of meeting the measure of a certain kind of imagination of the citizen. Mm -hmm. So in claiming animality, I am not just trying to use this or this powerful kind of vile issue that is certainly part of it. But I'm also like claim my own because I feel like I could do better <laughs> in embracing uh, my, you know, exercise to know and find our desires. So I, this is what the claim of animality suggests to me. Um, Benjamin, am I right? Sorry. I understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> My sound is gone. Are you Can able you to hear me? hear me, Faith? Okay. Oh, yes, I hear you. Okay, Benjamin, yeah. am I right that there was a question from Michelle Rowley about love? I don't see it anymore in the line. Oh, apologies. Yes, I think that might have um, vanished. Also, uh, Endel, are you able I to hear me still? Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. You're back. Sorry, you were you were uh, gone a little bit. So I will. Oh, I, I was apologies. Frozen. Um, uh, frozen. We could hear you, um, but I think the feed came through well enough. So I would like to ask. I apologies to Michelle and the audience. Your question to disappear, but let me read this um, as it's written. And I think this will probably be our last question, and then we can do some closing remarks. But so Michelle Rowley asks. Um, a, as I listen to the conversation, I also hear a discussion of love, even though not explicitly named a loaded concept in itself. So if we broaden it, how do you want us to understand the effective structure of the book? Hmm. I think that's for, I mean, I don't want you to understand it anyway. <laughs> that's, you know, what, what you, what, I mean, I think what I have done um, is make clear how much I've organized my life around love. You know, whole shifts as my academic trajectory have only happened because of falling in love and heartbreak and so on. And I think for me, I'm trying to be honest and true about things that maybe often are not exposed in academic projects. So what the reader takes from it, I don't know. I mean, I suppose I don't have an, uh, I, I suppose, well, I mean, I, I am trying to hopefully share stories and experiences that might connect with others and might provide a means through which we can have uh, connection and engagement and move forward. Um, but I don't, I don't think I have an answer for that, for what I want the reader to take. But I think I make clear how much I'm a, a victim of love <laughs> or someone. 
<laughs> you know, someone who values love or that feeling above all else. Great. So that's about all the time we have for questions. Um, I just want to turn things over to the two of you or at the end, anything you'd like to end with um, before I, I close the program. Hey, this was so wonderful. I just want to say thank you so much. It is always a treat, a pleasure to engage with you. And I am so grateful to have this moment with you. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin and the bookstore. And thank you everyone for coming to be part of this today. And similarly, I'd, I'd just say thank you um, to the bookstore and to you for your work. Uh, just there are many things I didn't say, just even about the way you imagine the, the way that the book is laid out, the, your, the way that you write. It's just a marvelous project and I can't wait to get it into my greedy little hands. So congratulations. I'm upset about because it was supposed to have arrived to on Monday. So I'll have to check with USPS. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh. And thanks to thanks once again to our speakers for this fantastic conversation. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. Please learn more about these incredible this incredible book and purchase uh, Nature's Wild at Harvard.com. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Mass., enjoy your weekend, keep reading, and stay safe. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Benjamin, I didn't have a chance to see the questions. Do you mind sending them to me? Just Oh, sure. Yeah, I can do that for sure. Thank so you, everyone. Bye. Oh